today I'm going to do a review on this Fluke 87 Series 5. I talked to my contact at Pomona and requested a Fluke review for this meter and he managed to arrange it for me which is great so thank you much Pomona and Fluke for allowing this to happen so I can share this review with you. Very much appreciated. So make sure you click like if you like multimeter reviews. We've got a big playlist which I've put all these reviews into, so make sure you check that out. It'll be right at the end of the video, it'll be like a playlist card over here at the end. So make sure you watch that at the end. And also subscribe and click the bell icon if you're new to the channel. Let's check this thing out. I did do a bit of a sneak peek in the mailbag recently, so it's, you kind of maybe had a bit of a spoiler if you saw that already. So get it out. Try to get it out. It's stuck in the box, I can't get it out. Ah, it's this bit. Okay, here we go. So, let's have a look. Obviously we've got the meter, tilting bail. Which will stand it right there. We have manuals. And we have leads and bits and pieces. So, leads are standard PVC leads. This is a bit of a shame. I, mean, I would have actually preferred to see a meter of this kind of calibre coming with silicon leads by default. I would have thought that most people that get these meters would have expected the same. I expect, I'm, I, I don't know, I could be wrong, I could be making a big assumption here. Maybe there's a reason to have PVC over silicon. I don't think there is a reason, but uh, I think I would have preferred to see silicon leads with this. I'm sure these are up to standard as required for the various standard existing supports. Maybe that's part of it, I don't know. But these are the TL75 series, actually, marked on the cables. And these are rated at CAT2 1000 volt. Cat 3 1000 volt, Cat 4 600 volt, that's what leads are rated to. So maybe that's part of the reason because of the high Cat ratings, maybe it's necessary. Still, it would be nice to have silicon cables though. I'm going to keep going with that, I think. Crocodile clips. Now, these are slightly better ones than normal ones I've seen. The actual insulated tips, it is. It's insulated there as well. That's nice. Both of them are. So, obviously, for the Cat ratings 1000 volt Cat 3, 500 volt Cat 4, 10 amp. So, that's obviously what the insulation part there is for. Nice. Here we have a couple of amp jack plug set. So obviously these are for plugging up the sockets on here if you're not using them. Slightly flexible. So 414-5802. Don't forget to check out the links down below as well. I'll be links down below to the Fluke website which they've supplied me for this. So go and follow those. You can get the manuals and everything. Download the whole lot for these things. You can get the user manuals. You actually get the um, calibration manuals there as well. So if you want to make sure you've got your meter working for well into the future, you can grab all those things now and you put them away somewhere and store them. So if you ever do need to recalibrate for some reason, maybe you lost memory or somehow you screwed it up and it needs to be fixed, you can recalibrate it. At least if you've got the correct tools, you can recalibrate it. But the information's there, which is a good thing. So you can register the products and stuff like that. QR code to download it. Some manufacturing thing. Information about what's in it. Container, it's probably some industrial requirement. IC compliance. Safety information booklet. Various languages. And a quick reference guide, which gets you started. So I had to do some of the basic measurements. I actually commented on this particular aspect previously about the quick start guide being in a professional grade multimeter. I thought it was a bit weird that you're teaching people how to do basic measurements. And someone pointed out that people which go to university, trade schools or wherever it may be, and haven't used one of these things before, they might actually need to be taught this. And I thought, okay, that's actually a fairly good point. You know, everyone has to start somewhere. Just because it's a professional grade meter, it doesn't mean that you bought it because you're a professional as such. It doesn't mean that you've progressed into that position. It might just be this is your first meter you ever bought, but because this is the, the standard that's required for the job. And so here's your meter. It's brand new. Never used one before. And here's how you do some basic measurements. On that point of view, I can actually understand it. So first time I thought that's a bit weird, but no, it does kind of make sense. And also got a thermocouple probe. I guess it's the K type. Yes, it does. Type K. It actually says so right there. Nice. I was actually doing a podcast about an hour ago with uh, Dan from Sip Electronics. I did a podcast with him previously, late last year I think it was. I just did another podcast with him this afternoon. We were talking about the Fluke multimeters. And he's saying they've got one there which is used in automotive use and his job. The thing's so robust it's been kicked around, dropped on the floor, dropped into an engine which has been running, you know, around the belts and stuff like that. You know, it's had so much abuse and it's been around for a while. So it had to put up with a lot of uh, misuse in the job. And it still works perfectly fine, nothing wrong with it. This is what you get with an industrial grade professional multimeter. You get the robustness, I mean these aren't cheap, this is an expensive meter, but what you're paying for is the build quality, part of it certainly is the name, the name is certainly a big part of it, but it's also got the history as well. You think about manufacturing, manufacturers make 
mistakes along the way, and then they correct those mistakes in future designs, and they learn from those errors. Or they, you know, learn from ways of doing things better, even. With a historical product like Fluke, you know, product Fluke's been around many, many years, decades. They've learned a lot along the way. And so you're not just paying for this meter, you're paying for everything before this meter as well. The technologies and evolution of the meters and the design that goes into them. So, yes, this thing, it's heavy, it feels like a brick, but it's robust. You know, it's designed to be in an industrial environment where it will get chucked into a bag and thrown around or dropped on the floor, or, you know, dropped from a few meters up and stuff like that. They're designed to be in that environment. So I'm already talking this product up, I haven't turned the thing on yet, right? But, you know, just the feel of this. I mean, over here I've got another Fluke. This is the 175, which Fluke also gave me for no cost for review. Now, this is nowhere near as rugged as this one. It's still fairly rugged, you know, it's designed rugged. But this one is definitely a lot beefier. This is still good. You know, it's got rubber buffering and stuff on it. It's a different feel. This is still pretty rugged, but this is, you know, this is really rugged. You know, industrial grade. Some of these industrial situations, people just get given a meter and say, use this meter, go do your job. They don't necessarily own the meter. They don't care about the meter, they just chuck it around. So they have to last. Anyway, I am think I'm going about enough. Right, that's enough waffle. Let's plug the leads in, turn this thing on. These connectors feel really... They're quite tight. That's actually quite a good fit. So I'll just measure these cables. These are 1.3 meters long. Let's turn it on. And let's do a continuity test, which is over here somewhere. Well, let's do resistance. We've got these clips on the end. Let's take these off. This is going to get in the way for now. So 6,000 count, looks of it. Now this is a 3.5 slash 4.5 digit multimeter. And it's got this bar graph which updates 40 times a second. It's also got some other features which you can turn on by holding buttons down. If you turn it on, you can do like a zoomed bar graph, which makes it more sensitive along central range. So it's like a central point at a reference voltage or something. And then you can go plus and minus from that and things like that. There's all sorts of little features in it. It's got a high res mode by holding down the illumination button for one second, which increases the resolution by one digit. Apparently, from what I read in the manual, I actually read the manual this time. It's almost unheard of. Let's change modes, which I think is this button. Capacitance, resistance, again. I guess that's the sound, is it? Yes, it is. So to do continuity, you have to push that button. Right. So go out of it, back in again. It's back on resistance. So if I leave that on, come off it, go back in, it's back on resistance. So each time you want to use continuity, you'll go into resistance mode, push the sound button. And that's how you go into it. All right. I've got the test of me in Johnston. We'll put this on and see how quick it goes as well. Diode mode. Yep, yeah, great, that beeps. And it means... Yeah, it does. It beeps as well. You see that on screen? Maybe you can. I, don't know. I should probably turn it around like that. Anyway. Can you see any of that when it's like that? Anyway, basic functions. Volts AC. It's also got a filter on there as well. So if you want to do a low-pass filter, I believe that's one kilohertz memory. So. It filters out any high noise interference. DC volts, DC mini volts with temperature. Obviously we're just showing ohms, sounder and capacitance on this one. So pushing the yellow button does the mode and pushing the sounder button here switches between those two. Obviously the test is done. Milliamps and amps AC and DC and microamps AC and DC as well. So we got this range, what's the default to? AC. Down there, defaults to AC as well. So we push the yellow button, that will change it to DC. and always defaults to the main function. Okay, got relative mode, Hertz and Gigi cycle percentage sign there, which I'm guessing will be on probably use AC modes, would they? Yeah, Hertz, Gigi cycle. I don't even get those on those, can you? Yes, you can. Does that mean get them anywhere? Yes, you can. What about this mode? I guess that's just a separate mode by itself then. Standalone, if it's on whichever mode it's on here, it doesn't seem to matter. All right, diode, can't do it on that one. Amps, you'd be able to do on that one, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Manual ranging. So 1000 volt max. So we've got four digits. Let's hold it down. Do we get five? What's well, four and a half? Maybe we will. Decimal place has moved over, so we probably can. Put it back. Min max, obviously. And you can change between centigrade and Fahrenheit on here as well. And there's all sorts of other little things you can do. So it's got basically every function you might want, really. I mean, microamps, milliamps, millivolts, 
Doesn't do millivolts AC though. It does millivolts DC? No AC millivolts. AC millivolts is probably hard to measure anyway, so not, probably not a big deal. So I just plugged in the thermocouple. Here we go. You get 23.5 degrees there, or so. If I plug it in backwards, it's always fun. Always plug things in backwards. See what happens. Very similar as well. Strangely, I thought it mattered. Anyway. So the backlight on here is actually more than one brightness. That's one brightness, and that's brighter again. Which you probably can't see because of the lighting I've got here. So that's off, medium, high, or low high, maybe, I don't know. So I suppose you can conserve your battery life, you don't need it fully bright. So let's hook up Ian Johnston's DMM continuity tester. This is something he built and sent to me as a gift, I suppose. He made these open source, so you can actually build one of these things yourself if you want. Let's plug this thing in to power. This runs with a 9-volt battery in this case. So basically what this thing does is it shorts out a cost of terminals so you can detect how quickly the continuity mode can actually work. So you can see how fast it is to respond to shorts across the probes. So it's got a 245 millisecond delay between pulses and the pulse length is currently 0.7 milliseconds. I'm going to wind it back up again so it starts beeping and we'll find a point where it's consistent. Now there is a pattern that does actually skip one, that's normal. So that's less than one millisecond anyway. So we can say 0.9 milliseconds. So I just want to check, let's actually see how the beep is on a diode test. So I put it in diode mode, let's test the diode. It's obviously charging cap in that case. Probably not the best choice, let's try a different one. There we go. So yep, it beeps on a good one. Which is what you want, so you can just do testing without actually looking at it. Open. Beep, yeah, that's fine. Next one. Beep, that's fine. So you can actually do testing with diodes without even looking at the meter if you've got that little beep. It's one of my favourite features of multimeters when you've got that beep when you're doing diode testing because it makes it so much quicker. You can just probe around a circuit even looking at the meter. And if it goes beep, you know, you're fine. You know what I haven't done yet? I haven't done the screen peel. Are you ready? Now nah, that's better. So the next thing I want to test is capacitance. So here's a 200 picofarad cap. Let's plug that in, see if we can read it. It's reading slightly high. But then it's also got that standing one there. So that's relative to that. Plug that in. 200 picofarad, bang on. <laughs> it is interesting the way it's not actually zeroed though. I would have actually liked that to be zeroed more, but it could be environmental noise maybe? I don't know. Zeroing would have been nice. Let's measure some more. So let's measure a 1 nanofarad. That's out slightly, so it's zeroed again. So we use that relative offset. That's pretty close there. Show it back in. There we go. That's pretty close. A couple of counts out. Again, there could be some issues here with zeroing properly. And Maybe this is a 20 nanofarad, let's just put the uh, guard on there. This is manual range apparently. Take it out of relative, then auto range. I don't know why it's in manual, maybe it's because I was playing with something else. So there's 20 nanofarad, auto range. I've got no relative measurement on there though, so we're going to be off by a little bit. So that's 0.3. If I unplug that, change range. Make that relative. There we go. 20 nanofarad, bang on. So now we do the microfarad range. Take the relative off. One microfarad range. Put the guard on. We'll plug that in as it is. Two counts out. Yeah, one or two counts out. That's fine. So I'm going to be putting this thing through its paces on my calibrator as well. My, my Datron 4700 calibrator over there, which does AC, DC, current and resistance. So we'll check it out on that as well and see how good that comes out. So make sure you click like and subscribe if you want to see more of these kinds of videos where I'm doing these multiple reviews and things like that. These reviews and this support I get from people viewing these videos 
is what's allowed me to have a good enough reputation for Fluke to send me this thing for a start. If I didn't have a good viewership, I didn't have people supporting me in those ways and actually coming back and watching my videos, I would never have got this meter from Fluke. Because obviously they want to get exposure, they want advertising for their product, but they only want to send it to someone which is capable of looking at it properly and giving it you know, a justifiable experience. You know, They want the exposure, I wanted a Fluke 87. Win-win. And you get to see how good it is. And this high res mode only works in certain modes, so capacitance isn't one of those modes. If I do it there, so you won't let you do it. I think it's resistance and voltage mode are the ones which you can do that in. Maybe current too, I'm not sure. We'll find out. So let's head over to the calibrator and see how good it turns out on there. It should be interesting. To the calibrator. So here we are over at the calibrator. I'm going to start with DC volts. We'll turn the unit on. Set zero volts. We've got zero volts. Let's do one. One volt. Perfect. And I expect no less. And I've also realised we've got the leads of this end back to front. I need to swap that around. This is negative one volt. Excellent. We'll swap it around. That's much better. Now it's positive one volt. It's true, both ways. <laughs> anyway, one volt. That's good. Let's do 100 millivolts. Perfect. 10 millivolts. Perfect. 1 millivolt. Perfect. I'll come back down to millivolt range afterwards. So 10 volts, that's perfect. 100 volts is perfect, and it can do 1000 volts. 1000 volts there. 900, 800, 7, 6, 5, perfect. Look at this. Every digit is perfect. That's impressive. So let's get a bit more of a challenge, shall we? Let's put in high res mode. Oh, look at that. One count out now. <laughs> let's get higher. One count out. Yeah. These are all. Oh, yep, perfect. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Come on. One more count. There we go. <laughs> so back at one volt range. Now I've got a high res mode. So 100 millivolts again. One count out. 10 millivolts. One count out. That's still really good. One millivolt, one count out. 100 microvolts. You can see it. Nice. All right, so now I've got on the millivolt range. Let's try this one. I've got it set zero volts right now. Let's do 100 microvolts. Yep, yeah, bang on. One millivolt, bang on. 10 millivolts, bang on. 100 millivolts is bang on. And now I'm over range because I'm in the volt range. So that's fine. I mean, that's excellent. Let's check out the AC next. So I'm now in the AC mode at 1 kilohertz. I've got it sitting at 0 millivolts right now. And this is gradually dropping down. It's kind of there, but it's dropping slightly. So it's almost 0. Don't think I'm in the high res mode still. I'm not sure what happened when I go out of high res. Maybe I'll do it. Out of high res. You're going to see 0.1 millivolts sitting there with nothing on it. Um, if I do filtering, does that help? No, not in this case. So it's picking up a little bit there. It's got a very slight offset, but not hardly anything. We'll leave it on high res mode so we can see what's going on. That's sitting there. Let's do one millivolt. So it's got an awful lot of stabilizing time going on there. But one millivolt AC, that's not an easy thing to pick up. <laughs> that's uh, slightly below, but that's not an easy thing to pick up, like I said, and that's not one kilohertz. So I'll probably come back and repeat this test at 50 hertz or something later on. So 10 millivolts.
10 mini volts is bang on. 100 millivolts. Oh, 100 millivolts sitting very slightly high, 23 counts. That's interesting. One volt is also reading slightly high, 19 counts. Don't forget my high res mode, so we've got an extra digit. 10 volts is also reading slightly high, 22 counts. 100 volts is 19 counts high. 203 counts high, 304 counts high, 406 counts high, 507, 6 is 10 counts high, interesting, 700 is 12 counts, 800 is 15 counts, 900, 19 counts, and 1000 is 23 counts. Interesting. So now I've switched to 50 hertz. Like I said, I'm going to come back and retest it. It's still settling down, so it's almost a one millivolt now, one millivolt output. And it's still stabilising, but it's basically there. So it is low voltages and AC are not easy to get or measure. So 10 millivolts is about three or four counts high. 100 millivolts is about 11 counts high. Don't forget this is in high res mode. If I didn't have high res turned on, it'd be one count high. This is 10 counts high on one volt. 10 volts is 13 counts high again if I didn't have high res on, maybe one count high. So 100 volts is 11 counts high. Let's go to higher voltage. So 600 volts, that's four counts down. 800 is nine counts down. That's not bad though. I mean, it's certainly good enough. 900 is 13 counts down. 1000 is 18 counts down, and 300 is one count up. Nice. So I'm just going to check frequencies on AC to check the resolution accuracy relative to frequency. So I'm going to output one volt. This is my usual test. I'm going to go right down. 10 hertz as far as I can go. And it's reading it, but it's jumping around a little bit. 20 hertz. Yeah, it's still jumping slightly, but 20 hertz is like the bottom limit, I think. 30 is doing better. 300 hertz, yep, that's fine. That's one kilohertz again. 10 kilohertz, yep, that's fine. 100 kilohertz, yeah, you can see there's something there, but it's not right. So let's bring it down so we find out where it starts working. I think the spec was 20 kilohertz. Yeah, so that's kind of the limit where you want to go, I think, 20 kilohertz. 15 is better. So let's try doing the filter. Yep, yeah, it's definitely cutting that out, isn't it? One and a half kilohertz is definitely trimming that out as well. well. That seems to work all right. So let's try frequency measurement. So 20 hertz, perfect. 50, perfect. 500, perfect. 5,000, perfect. 50,000, perfect. 500, you can't see. Let's try high voltage, sometimes that changes things. There you go. Now you can read it. 10 volts. You can see that now. Right, steel resistance. So I've got this hooked up. You can see I've got a slight offset here. Not a big deal, but that's at zero. So at 10 ohms, we're slightly high there. Don't think I'm still in high res mode. 100 ohms, 10 counts high again. 1K is very close. A couple of counts out. 10K is a couple of counts out. 100k is basically perfect. One meg looks like there's a couple of counts out. 10 meg is also a couple of counts out. And 100 meg is out of scale because the biggest I can do is 60 meg. Right, let's do milliamps now. So on milliamp range of DC, set zero microamps I've got in here right now, showing a little bit of leakage here. So 100 microamps, no worries at all. Gotta be careful not to blow the fuse, I've done that before. <laughs> 1 milliamp, yep, yeah, that's good. 10 milliamps, looking pretty good there. 100 milliamps, yep, yeah, couple of counts down, that's looking alright. We'll change over to the microamps mode on here, same jack on there, and 100 microamps again, and we're getting sort of 18 counts down. Uh, 50 microamps is 16 down, 10 microamps, yeah, that's linear scaling, so I think that's right. 1 microamp, yep, yeah, still 
down by 16. There you go up. Where's the limit on this? I don't know how to do it. 400. So I still read my cramps here. I want to find out what the limit is. There we go. There's the limit. So, 2 milliamps is the maximum for the microamp range. Also, it does this. If you have the plug in the wrong plug for the mode you're in, it warns you. That's nice. That's died because I disconnected from the milliamp socket and put it into the amp socket instead. Let's see how we go. So, I've got 10 milliamps on here right now, and I need to change this over to DC. And there we go, that's showing up all right. Obviously this is in the amps range instead. The one milliamp, yeah, that shows up all right too. And 100 microamps is kind of there, but I've got some error readings down here. So, so it's still 100 milliamps. That's fine. Two counts, three counts. One amp, a few counts down. I can't do 1.9 amps on this thing, it's the maximum. And we're about 10 counts down there. Don't forget, I'm still on high resmo. So now I've changed over to the AC amps range. Well, I'm on micro amps range right now. I should have actually done that one the other round, the first time around. I'm going to start micro amps this time. Then I'm going to go up to milliamps and then amps. And I'll do it in the right sequence this time instead of backwards. So you'll set a zero. You can see it's settling down. It's got a bit of a settling time there. We've got those low values. So it's still one milliamp. And that's definitely showing up. Look at that. No worries at all. 12 counts. I can't do the microamp range on this one on AC. It doesn't scale down that low. I have to do it in this method. So 100 microamps AC. And yeah, you can see it just fine. Happy with that. So let's change modes to a milliamp range. So 1 milliamp AC. Still at 50 hertz. Yep, that's doing fine. 6 counts. 10 milliamps. Mm. Yeah, about 12 counts out, 100 milliamps, 13 counts, 1 amp is over scale. Don't do that, Scott. <laughs> so now I've changed over to milliamps on the amps range, so it's gradually setting down. It does seem to have a settling time going on there. 10 milliamps. So it's gradually going to come up. got some filtering there obviously to stop noise or something to give you more consistent readings. Well 10 milliamps are showing up, one count over. Still 100 milliamps. The higher the current, the quicker it should get there. Look at that. One count over. Two counts. Is that it? Two counts over? Yep. And one amp. A couple of counts over. Let's go to the maximum. And there we go, about six counts down. Let's change this frequency. Let's just do one kilohertz here and see what happens. Yeah, that's okay. We're down to 1 milliamp again, just going to see what happens there. I thought maybe changing the frequency might make it settle quicker. I don't think it is. I don't think it's actually much better. I think it's just smoothing built into the unit. Back to the bench. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Let's pull this thing apart. So it's got a rubber baby bunker. Bun I can't say it. Ru bubba, rubber baby, bubba, baby bunker. I, uh, rubber baby. I don't know. Baby bumper? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> See how much skinnier this thing is without the, the holster on it? This is very much old school design, this, this kind of format, you know, it's like... So without the holster, actually, the holster is probably... Almost half the weight of it, actually. <laughs> so much as it's got in there to help protect it. Nice. Anyway, we'll get this cover off and have a look. This looks like we turn those like that. Quarter turn. That then pulls up. It takes a 9 volt battery. Okay, I'm not a fan of 9 volt batteries, but I'm only not a fan because I've got loads of AA batteries. I don't have many 9 volt batteries, and they're much more expensive to buy. Do I want to take that out? I think I can probably leave that alone. 
Let's take the screws out. So obviously these ones are plastic, not threaded inserts, but you shouldn't really need to open this up unless you do something really horrendously wrong and like blow a fuse or something. In which case, well, you know, you need the pain of taking it apart to remind you not to do that again. There's rubber inserts in there. So if you don't have the holster on, you can still use it on a desk without sliding around. And it works. That's nice. It's a nice touch, actually. Okay, well, that's how the screws out. Let's see how hard it is to separate. It's also got rubber around the ear as well. Nice, right, so I just pushed the spudger up here and it started separating. I'm not sure which way it's really supposed to go yet. I think there's probably a clip up the top here, so it's just separate from this end here. I'll try and get this popped off. I'm not sure which way it goes. Top comes off. Okay. Must be a clip. Here we go. And there's the inside. Two nice big fuses. Got PTC right there. Rubber buttons. There's a current shunt there. It's got this blast protection through here. There is blast guards. There's a reference resistor right there. Just down there. Big resistor as well. Oh, it does just lift out. Here we go. Let's do that. And there's the buzzer on the back there. There's some contacts. And there's the back of the board. Obviously this is all screwed together, sandwiched. I'm not going to completely dismantle it. Right now it's working. It's got some mobs in here too, as you expect. There's mob right there. I'm sure there's plenty of photos on the internet of these things being dismantled. So if you want to closely look in one of these, I suggest you look at that. It's actually quite nice on the dial here, as actually tells you which position is which. Right in here. Anyway, I'm going to put this thing back together before I do something silly. Oh, that's marginally interesting. I mean, if I really want to talk, I could dig into it, but I don't want to pull it right apart. If you really want to know what's inside one of these things, I'm sure that there's photos on the internet. And in fact, there's a really good chance that Dave from EV Blog, because he owns one of these, I'm pretty sure he's done a teardown on that. In fact, I think I even may have seen the video. So if you really want to know what's inside one of these things, go and check out Dave. I'm sure he's got a, a teardown for this thing. The main thing I wanted to do was the accuracy testing. So don't forget to check out the playlist. The playlist of all the multimeters I've worked on and done testing on. I've been very happy with these. This flux works quite nicely, I have to say. I do like these latches, those are nice. So if you do make a horrible mistake and blow a fuse, it's not that painful to get into it. And at least they're standard fuses, so it's accessible, you can change them, unlike some other meters I can mention. So my summary of this thing, well, it is what I expected. A very robust, very accurate meter. I did have some measuring discrepancies on my calibrator there, just minor ones. But I don't think I was using high res mode. If I wasn't using high res mode, you would have only been out by one count kind of thing. If you're going to use high res mode all the time, maybe it'll matter to you, but really, I think it's going to be fine. I've been fussy. I'm sure it meets the spec just fine. Build quality is, you know, it's built like a tank. It's, it's incredible. You can definitely tell the difference between an industrial meter and a non-industrial meter. You know, so it's meant to be used in industrial settings. It's definitely made much, much tougher. I like the fact it detected where the plugs were in the leads. So if you had the leads plugged in the wrong place, it warned you. That's a nice feature, I've made that mistake before. <laughs> Mind you, I've done a video about that. <laughs> I like the accessories you get, the fact it's all nicely cat rated, slightly better standard than the stuff you'd normally get. Would have preferred silicon leads as I said, but then these have got a higher cat rating than the silicon leads I'd normally see, so maybe that's why, I don't know. There may be a reason behind that. Maybe someone else can comment down below about that and if you know better about why these may be PVC instead of silicon, maybe there's a reason. Um, but I, I think I would prefer to see silicon leads on a meter of this kind of caliber, you know. Great feature set. Definitely going to enjoy having this on the bench. It's also got the holder on here for standard T pack mounts. So I've got one on this meter over here, which is my 117, which I also did a review on. I've got this sitting here because I'm planning to put this in my car. So this has got the T pack holder on that. And it's a standard format, so you can actually get this thing as well and put it on one of these. You can use it as a hanger. You can hang them up. These are very strong. I certainly wouldn't be worried about hanging this meter off it. Make sure you check out the links down below to go to Float, because say, without them seeing traffic going to the website for me doing this review, I may not get more review items in the future. Who knows? I mean, I may, I may not. They've been very generous with me so far. I've certainly been appreciative of that. And I want to make sure that they get some traffic going to them, hopefully from sales from the reviews I'm doing. I'm trying to do unbiased reviews, as I always do. If I see something I don't like, such as certain cables being absent, 
um, I will say so. It's pretty hard to pick holes in fluke stuff because they're good. So thank you very much Fluke for providing the meter for me to review. Thank you very much Pomona for arranging for the review. Without your help I wouldn't have these beautiful meters on my desk and I'd be a bit spoiled for choice. Now I've got, I've got a selection to choose from now. That's pretty awesome. I wonder what's next. 289. Is that, is that the one thing? Oh, 289. It's like those graphic graphing ones with the graphical displays. Yeah, I think they're a bit more expensive though. <laughs> We'll see, maybe in time I'll get one, eh? We'll see. I haven't asked. I probably should ask, but I feel like I'm taking advantage of them asking for these expensive meters and they keep sending me these things and it's like, yeah, great. <sighs> you know, this feels like I'm taking advantage and I'm not. The only interesting thing with this is that when I was doing the DC accuracy, as you saw, it was very, very good. Very accurate. And the AC was very slightly off. AC is not easy to get right because it's just the nature of it, it's a bit harder to calibrate and stuff like that. But that actually makes you wonder a little bit, was it this meter that's wrong, or is it my calibrator that's slightly wrong? I only have one AC calibrator. Well actually no, it's not true. I have three. Yes, I've got three. One is currently broken, which I need to fix. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it in the live stream, I don't know. One is an old 5200A, which I repaired, also fluke, which I repaired which had faults on every single board in that unit. And I recalibrated at the time using a Siglent multimeter, 3065X, which I got brand new, freshly calibrated. I just did that repair and I had that meter, a brand new multimeter. So I actually used that to calibrate that 5200A. How good is that? I don't know. And then the Datron, which I've been using, that is another meter which also repaired. And I've had no reason to doubt it so far, but you never know, do you? You know, I've had a couple of things where AC has been a bit off, but you kind of expect AC to be a bit off. But is it off on all these meters I've been trialing? Because if the AC is incorrect and all of these meters have been trialing maybe the meter is better than I thought and then my calibrator AC is slightly off I think my calibrator needs calibrating yeah that would be expensive and almost impossible to find someone in this country that will do it hmm. don't forget to click like and subscribe before you leave don't forget to check out the multiple reviews over here YouTube's playlist over here for things you think you should watch. Subscribe link over here if you haven't done it, spot me nagging you. And there's a Patreon support link over here, which you can use if you want to support the channel by giving me a small donation each month. It could be $2 a month, and it helps me to buy things to make repair videos out of and that sort of stuff. Bye.